wonderful panel. We're all super excited to be here with you today. And this being the last in the PHE Spotlight series, thank you so much to PHE Canada for giving us this opportunity. And um, yeah, we've got lots to talk about today. And we were all discussing how we're not gonna be able to fit it into our short windows. So we're going to get started. But before we get right into things and before I introduce the panel, I actually want to get everybody moving. And I can only see Sherry, Eugene and Glenn, but I'm trusting that all 300 of you on this call are going to get up and move with us. Okay, so many of us have been sitting all morning. So get up with us, this will be 10 seconds or 20 seconds. And I have to take my slippers off. We're going to do my favorite wacky jack just to get us moving. And you can easily, you're just going to go elbow to knee and you're just going to step and lift or you're going to jog it out. And I've got my dog here, so I have to make sure I don't hit him. So let's go 10 times. Awesome. Now squat, 10 squats. So we're making fools of ourselves in front of you. You better be doing it in the privacy of your home or school bathroom. Nice work. Let's do three more. And then I want you to just do an easy twist. Twist that torso. And let's do four more. Okay, shake it out. And come back and join us. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen and introduce the panel to you. So you might be familiar with some of us, depending on who's on the call. But myself, I am with the BOX program and I just have to catch my breath. I am the manager of programs and training and I've been with BOX for the past five years, either as staff or a volunteer, combination of the two. And I am passionate about getting kids active. And our panel today is coming to you from across the country. So I'm based in Calgary. Our next panelist is Sherry Stoddy, and she is the Health Promoting Schools Coordinator for School District 73, Kamloops Thompson in beautiful British Columbia. And she is a strong advocate for using movement as a strategy to promote physical and mental well being. Then we have Eugene Contreras, who is a PhD. PhD teacher from Elmer, Quebec, and he is a strong advocate for physical activity and education within the Western Quebec School Board. He coordinates WQSB elementary interscholastic sports and is a member of the Physical and Health Education Committee for English School Boards. He loves a challenge and teaching in the era of COVID-19 is certainly presenting one. And finally, we have Glenn Young, who many of you probably know, he is an educational and healthy living consultant, and he um, shares his expertise as this specialist consulting with schools around the world. And this is after a 35 year career as um, a district curriculum coordinator, department head, athletic director, teacher and coach in the largest school district in British Columbia. He firmly believes that how we move impacts how we learn. And I think all of us are coming to this panel with that lens today. And in terms of the focus for today, as you know, it's physical activity at a distance, but really one of the things I think our theme for today is really looking at the silver lining of this whole experience that we've just been through and what some of the new opportunities for movement have been and that we've seen across the country and that we can continue to implement as we go forward into the unknown of the fall. So that is our panel. And the structure for today, we're each going to take about 10 minutes. After each panelist, we'll take a few questions. And then ideally, we're going to have time at the end for some further questions and discussion. So please make sure you're chatting, sharing your questions, any resources you're wanting to share or amazing ideas that you've got that you'd like to share with everybody on the call today. In terms of box, many of you may know what this program is all about, but I just wanted to give a quick intro for those of you that don't. So it stands for Build Our Kids Success, and it is a free physical activity program. It's targeted at students in kindergarten through grade nine. But for those of you who have more of a secondary focus, 
I've worked with a lot of high school phys ed teachers as well who've just modified the program for their students. So there's definitely something for everybody within this. And just on that note, within our panelists today, I think we're all coming at it with a slightly different lens. So everybody is going to gain some back pocket ideas and, and new things that they can take forward. In terms of the program, the whole the box program, the whole idea is to get kids more physically active and impact their learning through this movement and impact their mental health. We are in a partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada and Reebok, and we have been in Canada for five years now. That's a quick intro to Box. So here, I just wanted to share with you some of the ways that we've been getting active at home with the Box program, and then even outside of that. So this is me with my daughter, Katrina, who's in grade seven, and also my son, Carson, who's in grade five. And we were, I was very lucky to be able to share some of what we were doing with Box during this at-home period with both of my children. And one of the things that my daughter really did was step up and show some of her student leadership. And I know Sherry's going to speak to that piece, just the opportunity of getting our kids showing their leadership through physical activity. And I know just in this three months, she really matured and gained confidence through being able to teach some of these Facebook Live classes with me that we did as part of Box. And we ran these every day at 12 o'clock Eastern, you know, where they were 20 to 30 minute classes based on our traditional Box lesson plans. And then my son helped out with some burst videos that we shared with students across the country and had a lot of fun with that as well. But even outside of these box related activities, I know we really thought outside the box and I know that's what teachers are doing across the country. And a couple of things that I just wanted to share, of course, everybody saw the ping pong, everybody playing ping pong at home. We definitely did that, but we took it to the next level as well with pickleball in the house. And I don't recommend that because we did break a uh, light in the process. So just some creative fun ways that we kept moving over the last few months. So what I wanted to highlight here are that our box resources, one of our focuses as we go forward is making sure that we're providing you with things that you can use to keep your students physically distant if that is a requirement and it looks like it will be as we go into the fall. And the idea that um, they can, these resources can be used in the classroom setting. So I really encourage you to share them with your whole school and the classroom teachers who can utilize them throughout the day with their students. Obviously outdoors is gonna be a big area of focus so they can be done outdoors and also during PHE and then also still within the home environment because we know that might be a reality looking towards the fall or at some point in the 2021 school year. So our box bursts, these are like what you would be familiar with as BPA. They are one to 10 minutes in length and they're just designed to keep the students active throughout the school day. And our focus on these going forward into the fall will be just keeping the kids active throughout the day at a distance in their own space. So right now, one of the things that you can check out on our website, which is boxkids.ca, is a blog that we recently put out about top 20 bursts to stay active at a distance. And we'll continue to be putting these resources out for schools throughout the fall. But you can grab this now, and that's an image of, of it um, in the left-hand corner, and just back pocket it. And you can even start practicing some of these ideas. And we have loved the creativity that we've seen. I know that some of our schools are doing these box bursts before their Google Meet, just to get kind of similar to what we just did before this session, but getting their kids moving before they're going into their, whatever session they're doing with their students. So they will continue to work in that at-home setting or within your school environment. And then we've created calendars these last three months as well, with a whole bunch of different ideas for ways to stay active on a daily basis. And we will continue that this fall in a simplified version where we'll continue to give four new bursts every week and also a mindfulness activity because we know this is what everyone's hearing about the importance of wellness for our students as they're going back into the school setting in the fall. So the bottom corner here of this slide just shows you what these bursts look like. So they're always available in a written format for you to utilize and then also video. And this is where they're very straightforward. So if you're integrating students or junior trainers, they can easily read and then 
learn and teach these bursts to their fellow classmates as well. So in order to access these, you can go to our website, enroll your school, and sign up for weekly emails. So we have weekly burst emails that will include all of this, and it will include the links to the videos as well, with the focus on physical distancing and mindfulness. So we wanted to compile just a top 10 list for you about some physical distancing ideas and resources through Box that you can access. And just to be clear, all of these resources are available through our website that you can access through our trainer hub or through our at home page. So check it out, enroll your school or go to the at home page and see what you can integrate into your programming for the fall. So our first idea here is games. We love to take board games or any games that you're familiar with and make them active. So we actually have a Boxopoly board that you can print off, laminate and utilize, Box Bingo. And then we recently did a blog related to physical activity through board games. So some different ideas there. We also have an ABC workout poster that students love and it's something you can just print off you can access on what we call our trainer hub put it in your gym or whatever space you have or give it to the teachers to put in their classrooms and they can come in and just start off their morning by spelling out their name doing that workout related to their name some of the other physical distancing things that we feel will be really effective are ladders tabatas and stations and through our box burst document we have a lot of bursts related to these different areas so definitely check that out and then, of course, we love to dance at Box and we love music. So we have a few Box Spotify playlists that are all clean and ready to use with your students. So I encourage you to check that out and then use those if you're running one of our traditional fitness lesson plans or the Box Bursts. Another idea for the fall, all of our functional fitness lesson plans have a running component to them. One of the ideas is you can go to our lesson plan document and pull out some of these running ideas and then create a fall challenge or a September challenge where you're integrating these running activities every day and maybe you're working towards a run like the Terry Fox run. So that's one great idea and they're all really fun activities. So the kids aren't realizing how hard they're working throughout them. We did a number of challenges these last few months that the kids really resonated with and we'll continue that in the fall. So stay tuned for that. And one of the things I really encourage you to do is if you haven't been familiar with Box, is look back at what we put out over the last few months and repurpose it for the fall because it will all still be relevant at that time. And then we just wanted to end with a couple of tips. And one is certainly to engage student leadership. And we will be putting out junior training, Box Junior Training training that you can use in your school settings to train your students to then run box throughout the school. And I know Sherry's gonna speak more to that. And then finally, consistency. One of the things that I know again within Kamloops School District and Sherry will be talking to it is they've run box first thing in the morning every day during this at-home period with the Facebook Live classes. For us in Calgary, it's been 10 o'clock every day. And now my kids come to me and say, it's box time if I'm you know, still stuck in a meeting or something like that. So there's a few ideas you can back pocket and make sure you check out on our website. And I just wanted to highlight that the reality that we know this coming school year is that we could be back at home again. So I encourage you to check out the Box at Home page on our website where we have the bursts, the lesson plans, and we have a whole array of yoga and mindfulness videos that you can access for your students. And this is just a look if you haven't seen it what our June monthly calendar looks like. And you can always check it out now, even try a couple of things before school wraps up for the year. And the challenge I wanted to highlight here is when you look at this map at the bottom, this was our challenge for June and it's where in the world have you exercised? And our trainers and teachers have really loved the cross curricular piece to this because each of the links, you learn about a different part in the world or place in the world. And all of the activities related to this are outdoors and can really be done in, through that whole spectrum of ages, primary and secondary. YouTube channel, I've been talking a lot about our videos. If you go to the Box Canada YouTube channel, subscribe and get notifications, you will be able to access all of our different videos to utilize with your students. And these include our bursts, our yoga pieces, and these Facebook Live videos that we've done for the last few months. And those can absolutely be now used in the school setting, and we will have written lesson plans to go along with those as well. So stay tuned, what we've got coming up, we've got a summer fun pack that's being released next week. And this is something you can send out to your students so they can stay active over the summer months. 
And going forward, we are going to continue to have opportunities for the home and school environment and back to school focus, of course, in September with um, the focus on physical activity at a distance and mindfulness. And if any of you are interested in professional development specific to some of these ideas for your staff, then please reach out to our regional coordinators, depending on where you are in the country. So that is a quick quick overview of box and some of the resources you can access and some ideas of what you can implement this fall. And I'm sure I've already gone over time, so I want to be able to pass it off. But Faye, before I do, are there any yeah. questions should address? So um, Nicole is asking, will this webinar be a focus on elementary or um, secondary? So um, maybe you can answer to that. Yeah, I think um, each of us is going to speak to a slightly different, slightly different focus. So I know awesome. I think genes will be applicable for both. Um, I think all of the next three will be applicable for both primary and secondary. Perfect. Um, and Megan is asking, how do you access the Vogue's trainer hub? Uh, and also Jeff is asking, um, is there a cost associated with the Vogue's kids program? Um, both great questions. So to access the Box Trainer Hub, you can enroll your school and it's a really straightforward process. So if you go to boxkids.ca, uh, I believe top right hand corner, just click on the enroll here button and that's the step you need to get started. And then once you input all your information, we ask you some questions to set up session information, basically how you'll be using the resources and then you can access all the resources in the Trainer Hub and everything, mm -hmm. there's no cost. So through our partnership, we're able to provide all the resources for free. Perfect. Um, and I know that folks, Canada, I think you have a, a U.S. counterpart, but I um, I cannot answer this question. So Jessica said, does your school have to be in Canada to enroll? I work at an international school in China. Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and I need I need Lynn on board. We do have we have box schools uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. So going to maybe grab that information and I will follow up with you. We definitely have them in different parts of Japan and the US and there are ways okay. that you can involve for sure. So I'll follow up with perfect. the individual directly. Yeah, perfect. So Jessica, maybe my suggestion is to send Shannon an email um, and then uh, you can talk to each other directly and see if there's any opportunities there. Um, and the next question is uh, by Steve. And the question is, do Vogue's resources differentiate it by grades on the on the website? Uh, on the uh, site, actually, on the site. Yeah. Uh -huh. So some of our first will specify what grades they're targeted at. So if they're more K to three appropriate, or if they are K to nine, but it, they they are all specified within that K to nine range. Awesome. And Jeff said. No, sorry, um, Megan actually. So she's asking, is the calendar available on the website or is it actually you have to enroll first? So you don't have to enroll. That's a great question as well. Mm -hmm. So the calendar, everything that we put out kind of April, May, June is available on the stay at home page on our website. So you just have to enter your name and email address, I believe, and then you can access that information. Perfect. Um, so I think we can move on to the next panelist. There are a couple of other questions, but I'll send those questions directly uh, directly to you, Shannon. Wonderful. All right. Okay. So, thank you. So yes, now I'm going to pass it on to Sherry Stoddy, who's going to take you through a bunch more information. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to share our continuity of implementing daily physical activity in the Calence Thompson region. Regardless of where the learning takes place, our teachers will find you. After meeting with various staff from elementary and secondary schools, I was so impressed with the creative ways our teachers reached out to their students during these uncertain times. 
our city <clears throat> has approximately 92,000 people with 30 elementary schools in our region, with eight of them rural as far away as three hours from the city of Kamloops. Six years ago, after supporting many schools and health initiatives, I felt we needed to focus change, brain health. This was really the big buy-in for teachers. We registered 18 schools, provided professional development for teachers and community partners, modeled facilitation, supported and implemented um, the box programming before school, first block of the day, in PhD classes and integrated into after-school programming. We really focused on 10 schools the first hour each day um, to intermediate um, classes, multi-grade, four to five days per week, 30 minutes per day, all year long. After implementing uh, this program, for six years, we saw a lot of teachers co-facilitating with their students. We wanted to focus on bursts outside of the classroom. So we thought we should um, start training uh, leaders. Some of these students have had box for five or six years. So this seemed to be the natural evolution for box in the Kellis region. So on October 23rd, 2019, we trained 110 mentors. Our most experienced box schools for a half day of training. Uh, you'll notice in these pictures, the facilitators are being the mentors training the students. Uh, we never imagined how excited and enthusiastic those students would be after we handed over the responsibility to them. Uh, schools implemented their mentors in very different ways. In one school, for example, they um, the mentors facilitated three times per week in the primary classes. So in that particular school, 250 students in the intermediate grades had um, box every morning. And now we're up to 400 students in that school is getting box at least three to five times a week. So really a fun way to involve kids in leadership role. March 11th, moving forward very quickly, we trained our second cohort of mentors. And what was really cool about this training session, our experience mentors led this session and uh, the second cohort comprised of five new schools that don't integrate box regularly into their programming and our facilitators felt so respected so valid and then everything changed after this day march 23rd is when we went back to work in the Kells thompson region and the way we communicated was very different. Our communication platforms in this region, these are the six ways I noticed our teachers were communicating with each other. All of a sudden, Google Classroom was our main communication source to our families and our students with teachers creating uh, websites. Uh, very stressful for some educators because they've never done this before. Zoom became our new reality for face-to-face. -face. Uh, teachers were going to YouTube to find um, uh, programming. They were creating their own on YouTube. Facebook became a place where we sent our students for live sessions, which we would never have done before. Instagram was used for uh, junior high, more high school, and one staff used Instagram as a means to model physical activity, to encourage their staff population. For myself, in, in terms of uh, gathering information for teachers that could be useful, there was really a call to action to our provincial and Canadian partners. I literally phoned Shannon at Box. Can you share all your stuff? Can we share it with everybody? And um, they talked about what they were doing for the home setting, so that was amazing. amazing. PG Canada produced lots of resources, which were our go-to resources for our teachers. I phoned Melanie, the founder at Dance Play. Can you share some of your resources? They went live three times per day. The other resources on here are for mental health. I phoned those um, organizers as well. What are we doing for the at-home setting? So it was really important for our district with 30 elementary schools and 11 high schools that we share resources that they're familiar with and can count on and that are evidence-based. How we communicate so that everyone can get the information was really important. In School District 73, um, we, our school board created a 
kind of an internet situation where we the coordinators gave update, updates every week, so we knew everyone in the district would have access. We have Bonnie Henry in BC, and her themes are be kind, be calm, be safe. So I really wanted to share information to reduce stress for teachers on programming that they are familiar with. And this was very much appreciated by our teachers. Our internet was new to our district, so getting people there was challenging. So we connected them with them with every, any way we could. We didn't really have access to our administrators, so we really had to count on this. Myself and colleagues within School District 73 uh, co-created HyperDocs, uh, connecting through activity, connecting through mental well-being, and connecting through food literacy. We created slide decks, adapted everything to the home setting. These three HyperDocs were very well received and utilized. One of the reasons I chose HyperDocs is because once a teacher would open that, it would stay in their heart, in their Google Drive, so that was a very valuable resource for them. And through this HyperDoc, I had requests to do Zoom staff meetings so that students, our teachers would know how to use them. In terms of highlight silver linings for what was happening in our PE classes, the creativity and the connections I was just amazed with because I didn't interview a lot of teachers. What we measured and encouraged changed in PE at home and with partial uh, coming into schools now. Weekly goal setting with reflections was routine now. Core competencies, self-awareness, responsibility to others, thoughts, emotions, and feelings are reflections that were recorded to phys ed uh, teachers. For the first time, students had to plan out when they were going to exercise and what that would look like. Students were given choice and activity in how they shared evidence with an emphasis to get them outside. Weekly tasks focused on theory, heart rate labs, training principles. Teachers sent out surveys to create class discussions on how uh, students would like to learn. Uh, in our rural areas, they didn't use Zoom because they didn't have internet access, so they used other formats. Uh, lots of encouragement of moderate to vigorous reflection logs, uh, teachers providing examples of how they can get that, and handing it back over to students. How do you know you're exercising moderate to vigorously? So those labs were great. Um, weekly challenges, uh, there's one example here on uh, will a fitness app help me um, improve my health? So uh, one thing I would recommend to all of you, uh, many of the teachers shared their Google Classrooms as an educator with me. So I have a lot of assignments that were handed in to me, so I wouldn't recommend that. But I did see a lot of interesting assignments. So just changing the tasks that we're getting students to do and we're able to incorporate a lot of theory. To the very right, um, here's a document from our after school coordinator. Um, if we couldn't um, connect with people through technology, I was really impressed with what our teachers and our coordinator in the after school program created. This is a document, a package that Alex Ingalls put together, who is our coordinator, where in, a, in some of our most vulnerable schools where they bought soccer kits and put the PDF together uh, so that families could pick it up. If families could not pick it up, they were delivered to their houses. And this was kind of the same story in all our schools. They created packages if people didn't have access. Uh, some of our P teachers went to visit students at home if they had not heard from them. So there was something for everybody. Maintaining, maintaining box during this time, the moderate to vigorous exercise, as Shannon had already outlined, they made these fabulous calendars with many access points. If you couldn't go on digitally, there was a PDF version that people could print off and have access. Uh, in our um, schools, box was the number one requested resource from teachers, whether they were in box or not, because we had done a lot of professional development. Teachers created locally developed slides where they either embedded box videos in them or, or sent them to live um, classes. I was really impressed uh, with the moderate to vigorous labs that were created in the elementary school system. And one complaint about the box, the students were used to uh, moderate to vigorous attainment for 30 minutes. The sessions were 25 minutes. They wanted them longer. So really impressed with the universal design of the multiple platforms that box has put together so we can reach all our learners. Uh, we know that families were doing box in the morning with their students and staff were challenging their students to some of those bursts. 
really impressed with the reflections of uh, reporting their participation in these activities. So we were able to maintain that moderate figures attainment outside um, at the in the home. Um, what's going to happen to our student mentors? Originally, when we went home, I talked to a few teachers and we were going to produce some videos that could be used in their Google Classroom because students are familiar with them. So on connecting with uh, Shannon, uh, in September, our schools are ready to do a blended learning training model. Uh, we would probably have a little bit of it maybe in a Zoom session and the schools will be separated with maybe 15 um, mentors in one school. We'll have maybe three schools at the same time. So a little bit online, they go practice, then come back online. Um, Teachers still want to do the multi-training groups, um, uh, student-led box bursts. We want to pre-record them so that if the grade six and sevens, the students are familiar within their school, more than likely they will probably do them um, online. So we really want to do this as a locally developed pre-recorded videos for school connectedness. Uh, I've met with a few of the students online and they really want to get going next year, so I can foresee us having some collaborative meetings. Um, I really want to do a big shout out to our Canadian partners. Um, the resources that you shared were very thoughtfully put together. It provided access to all our teachers and we are so grateful. It is very much appreciated. So that's our Kamloops story. Thank you so much, Sherry. And uh, I think there's one question for you. So, um, Phils is asking, is your box program part of your PE classes or is it a separate? Um, okay. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, it is not a part of our PE class. Uh, that's devoted time, 30 minutes per day to DPA. And there are usually two to three phys ed classes added on to that. Okay, nice. Uh, Shannon, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, I'm just, I yeah, I loved kind of everything that you had to share. I especially really appreciated your focus on inclusion and equity and how you reached some of the students that didn't have access to technology. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also wondering, like, when you implemented some of these big changes in your school in terms of like the 9 a.m. box and things like that, how did, was there resistance and how did you deal with that? Okay, I did not implement that alone. I'm very big on consulting and bringing teachers together. So when I talked about the 10 focus schools, we started out with 18, I introduced the concept. Some people wanted to continue, others wanted to implement it in a different way. So we found that that first block of the day was the most effective. It created an equal playing field. Kids were ready to learn. They were focused. So when schools did it three days a week, and I brought the teachers together to talk about their programs, uh, they wanted to go five days a week. So it was continuous uh, consultation with the schools, how they want to move forward. Um, so it really came from them. Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. So there's another question from um, Rob. Um, so Rob is saying uh, he'd like to see the resources page again, but I think because our time is limited, so we'll just share all the PowerPoint after the session. Uh, and so you will have that slide um, for your reference later. Um, and uh, Fiona is asking, is the PDF by Alex available online? Uh, Alex has it as um, a resource within her um, after school programming. She that could be a whole other webinar. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> no, I'm serious. What she did for our vulnerable students will blow your mind away. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so we'll move on to the next panelist. Wonderful. So Eugene has with Quebec being one of the first provinces to head back into the classroom. He's got a lot of experience that he can speak to and he has been on the ground. So I look forward to everything he has to share. All right, hello everybody. Can you see my screen yet? Okay, I'm not seeing my screen. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So, physical activity at a distance, and uh, the objective is to keep uh, kids healthy and active at this time. I'm Eugene Contreras, and I'm teaching in Gatineau, Quebec. Uh, so before COVID came around, uh, the context in Quebec was probably pretty similar to what it is in the rest of the country. We're lucky here in elementary schools to have uh, specialists. I know that's not always the case in all provinces, um, but we don't have a specific DPA mandate. It is something that is recognized as being important, um, but it's not specifically mandated. Anyway, when uh, COVID came along, uh, we were shut down for a couple of weeks as a holiday from March 13th to the 30th, and that's when online learning really began. Um, of course, people have already talked about all kinds of resources out there. Uh, I didn't do that for too long because we came back to school on May 11th, so uh, I'll let what, what Sherry said and the resources more stand for themselves. But while I was doing the online part of things, my objective was really as much as possible to get kids away from the screen. Um, and a lot of what the, our own Ministry of Education was putting out and also going to different resources, it references other online places like YouTube or uh, GoNoodle or whatever, which are all good things, the box uh, videos and whatnot. Um, so I included some of that in my online stuff, but also just activities that get kids away from the screen was really, yeah, was really my main focus. And I prepared like a, a weekly calendar um, with the uh, with activities over the course of the week for kids to do. But I don't really even know how many of the students uh, did that because it was always a, an optional situation for them. And I sent my stuff through the uh, through the classroom teachers. Um, anyway, I want to move on. There were a lot of other online uh, ways of doing things that I. Uh, heard about in, uh, in a Quebec uh, session yesterday and then last week that we had. So on May 11th, schools reopened, but we just before we reopened, this came out on Quebec social media, uh, which means that there's no physical education in, after the lockdown, um, which was a shock to, <laughs> to a lot of people. That's what our Minister of Education said at one point, but it was a misinterpretation of the directives that the, um, the public spaces are closed. So there was no gym, but to me, that didn't at all mean that there was no phys ed classes. Uh, and we were able to advocate and convince our administrations and lots of people across Quebec did that physical activity and education was even more important, if anything, now than, uh, than before the lockdown. So we had to restructure phys ed. So this is what we did at Lord Elmer School. And again, it's just a way of doing it. Um, yesterday, I sat in on this, this session in French and there were three other phys ed teachers in different regions of Quebec with different contexts that came up with very different models. Some overlap, but uh, but different ways of doing things. So this is just uh, what what we came up with here at our school. So the first thing is that phys ed has to be outdoors as much as possible. Um, and uh, very quickly it became evident that uh, phys ed teachers, spatial awareness is what we do, right? So that two meter distance is, uh, was something that was part of our teaching um, when we came back. We're used to setting up boundaries and zones and things like that. So I had lines painted on the grass and in the asphalt and so on to keep people separate, but also did activities with the students to help them understand what that two meters was. Uh, so everybody got a skipping rope and a tennis ball to begin with. We had enough in our inventory to be able to do that with the numbers that we had, which were very much reduced numbers from our regular uh, population. Um, and so, you know, if you spin the skipping rope around your head, that gives you your two meter bubble. We did uh, standing long jump and understanding how far you can jump. If you would risk bumping into somebody uh, as you jump, then, you know, you're too close. And just giving that, that physical sense of, uh, of the two meters while doing movement activities was, uh, was good. Um, there was, uh, you know, of course, if there's uh, pouring rain, uh, you have to have a back, uh, a back pocket plan. So in that case, uh, the plan was to do a Zoom activity session from an empty classroom. And luckily, we've been lucky with the weather, and I've only had to do that once. We've been outside. If it's drizzly a little bit, we're still going outside. 
but uh, pouring rain, I did a Zoom session from a classroom and that went well too. Um, and the other thing is just to uh, encourage and support movement in the classroom and uh, use of outdoor spaces by the classroom teachers as much as possible as well. So I've been doing that and a lot of the teachers uh, have really extended what we've done in phys ed class uh, with their own students, which is great to see. There have been a lot of things to learn over this over this period and uh, the first thing right off the bat was that being bored can really be a good thing. Uh, I was talking to the students about, about, you know, the two approaches to boredom, one being I'm just bored and there's nothing to do and then I'm bored so what can I do? And that's the approach that, uh, that I'm encouraging them to take in everything that we do. So just with a skipping rope and a tennis ball, for example, challenging them to, to find as many ways as they can to use them, to flip them, to toss them, to bounce the ball, to use the rope to balance the ball, even just practicing tying knots, different kinds of knots with the skipping rope, all kinds of things that you can do just with that limited material. Um, I also saw that uh, students can really have meaningful interaction from two meters apart, even with that distancing. Uh, Different from, you know, working on strategies and tactics in team sports situations, but it is still meaningful interaction. We've got uh, over here uh, a couple of girls uh, doing a find my tree activity. So in a wooded area, they had to lead their partner with their eyes closed, or this girl has her hat over her eyes, I think, um, leading them to a certain tree where they had to feel around the area and then get back to their starting point and try to identify um, which tree they were at just based on the, the terrain and the use of their other senses. So there was a lot of really good communication back and forth going on there. Um, I also have done other thing, partner activities with uh, uh, full body rock, paper, scissors uh, activities where kids are doing different fitness skills and, and so on. So there's still interaction going on. Um, there are a lot of ways to make things work. So there's been uh, just, oh, sorry, uh, the PHE community support's important. I've talked about a couple of webinars or, or sessions that I've been in on and just seeing the way things work in different ways is really cool. And physical literacy is really about developing competence and confidence in a variety of envir environments. So this has really forced us to use those different environments rather than just staying with what we know and being comfortable in our gym. Um, so I discovered that there are really a lot of things to do. So track and field was something that I started off with, the long jump and, uh, and running activities and working on running protocols when you're running around a, uh, the field, for example, just passing on the left, slower traffic, keep to the right, and just getting those two meter distancing uh, rules in place. Uh, skipping is always a great activity and I had the kids prepare skipping routines as part of our, our courses, ball manipulation skills and challenges painted targets on the wall for kids to throw at. And these are things that kids have taken and continue to use during recesses. And like I said, some teachers have also uh, um, carried that over. All kinds of golf variations. Um, so we use the tennis ball with uh, hoops on the ground for, uh, for golf activities. This picture down here is our airplane, paper airplane golf uh, with the um, discs because we weren't allowed to share materials. So even like using flying dis uh, frisbees from one class to another i wasn't allowed to do that uh, so i had them bring a paper airplane out and we uh, did a combination ball throw paper airplane uh, golf game that the kids really enjoyed um hopscotch uh, uh, is a, was a new discovery for a lot of the kids and they were really creative with cre making different kinds of hopscotch grids not just your usual one to 10, so this one right here is a space theme, I think. Um, dance is another activity that you can do individually and collaborative, collaboratively from two meters apart. And my personal favorite was our uh, neighborhood nature walks that we did, so I've got a few slides of that. So we had sticks and stones activities. I, I took the kids, I explored a little bit around the neighborhood, everything within 15 minutes walk of our school. And luckily we have uh, already set up from previous years, um, uh, we have set up so that the parents at the beginning of the year give kind of a blanket permission to uh, take students off of school grounds as long as it's within walking distance. So I didn't have to send out permission slips for every outing, which was fantastic. 
Um, that's certainly something to look into. And uh, and so I took the kids to the river. We're lucky enough to be uh, within 15 minutes walk to the river where there were some stones and just doing things like skipping stones or building stone structures and balancing them and uh, building nookshooks and that kind of thing it was fantastic. The kids loved it. Um, I played a sticks versus stones bocce game using the tennis balls that we have as the as the target and the kids gathered three sticks or three stones and that's what they were tossing to play bocce loved it it was great uh this is one place we went to that had a creek and we're stepping over the the stepping stones so it's just looking around in your neighborhood and uh seeing what's there and and i explored further than i have in the past around the school and discovered some really cool spots so trees, of course, are the original place structure. So another focus of a class was uh, was on trees. Um, found some really neat trees. This one here, where we're uh, got a few kids, maybe not quite two meters in a couple of cases, but uh, but pretty good on the tree here. Uh, one spot I found actually had a hanging vine that uh, was strong enough to support our weight. So we sanitized our hands before going on the vine and uh, had a bit of a swing on that. Kids loved that. They wanted to get back there. And a lot of these places, kids have said, you know, oh, I'm going to bring my parents back here. So it was a discovery for them of their own environment as well, which was pretty cool. Um, another activity did was natural fitness circuits. So uh, some of the similar things as, as uh, you can do with, with regular circuits or box bursts and so on, but using natural materials to uh, to just found objects to uh, to make your circuits. So each of the students uh, or with a partner or on their own made a little circuit with four stations. They were allowed to use sticks or stones that they found, uh, their water bottles, their skipping ropes, and uh, create a little station for, uh, for everybody to go through. And then we took turns going through that. Kids love that. We did it again when I brought them back to the uh, back to the schoolyard situation and just found stuff around our schoolyard to make uh, different little circuits and were different every time. So that was fantastic, looking at the different components of fitness. So where do we go from here? There's a lot of uh, good things, I think, that we can take from here and move on no matter what the situation is. Um, the first is just the ability to be flexible and creative and jump into whatever situation we find ourselves in the fall. So the scenarios range from uh, having fewer students here to basically being 100% uh, back to where uh, we would normally be, but with some um, spacing, distancing protocols and whatnot. And as of uh, Quebec government announcement in a couple of days, that looks like what our, we're aiming for for September. But then we might end up back in October in a shutdown situation. We never know. Um, but what doesn't change is that the kids need to move. So that's something that is uh, ongoing and has to be our has to be our focus. Um, ongoing communication with uh, within the phys ed community will continue to be important, and that's something that's for me been really good here. Uh, you know, communicating with our uh, we have two Quebec physical education associations, one in English, one in French, and PHE and Box and all of this, all of these people getting together to uh, to talk about their experiences and their contexts has really been enriching. So let's keep that up. Um, and uh, and it's important to advocate for phys ed and movement activities across the curriculum um, and in classrooms now more than ever, uh, because likely, you know, the um, uh, in our classrooms anyway, the students are very much more restricted with their spacing protocols that we've got. And we've got to uh, realize that the kids have to have to find outlets for movement. Um, and we should continue to uh, use what we've learned as a creative inspiration to include in our phys ed program. So me personally, I'm going to use these uh, nature walks and extend that kind of theme for uh, for my classes more than I have in the past. And uh, I think, you know, this can be this has been an enriching experience for me and for some of the students especially with the smaller groups that we have they've had we've had a chance to have a lot more individual attention which has been really great for some of the kids um and uh and i think there's a lot we can we can use moving forward so whatever the scenario is we can and we must continue to promote healthy habits for life and uh that's what we're here for thank you 
Awesome, Eugene. And uh, we have received a lot of questions, so we'll, we'll try to cover um, some of them. So uh, the first question is a simple one. It's from Fitz. Um, and the question is, how long are your PE periods? Okay, so when I first came, normally they're an hour long. And mm -hmm. when we first came back, um, we had different numbers, but my, my phys ed periods were still, I was able to do hour long blocks once every two days for each uh, group that was here. Um, so that was great for my outings. An hour was, was great because depending on whether we were jogging or walking, it could take up to 15 minutes to get where we were going. So to actually do an activity there, I needed a little bit of time. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, our numbers changed. So I ended up with fewer groups. And so now I'm doing phys ed every day uh, for, with six groups for 40 minutes. Um, so um, I wouldn't be able to do it the same way my nature walks with a 40 minute block. Um, so I'm doing other activities there. Awesome. And I just want to share this comment. Aaron said, uh, Eugene, I love that you use nature, uh, nature space and objects to meet the curriculum while maintaining the COVID-19 protocols. Um, so that's, uh, I agree with him. Um, it's, it's great. And the next question is regarding uh, masks, I believe. So um, I am seeing uh, Sue and, and Matt, they're both asking, uh, do the student have to have to wear masks? And uh, when it's winter, uh, will you still go outside? Um, and will you ask students to, to wear masks in winter? So the mask situation in Quebec has been very uh, up and down in terms <laughs> of instructions from, uh, from government. Um, uh, teachers are not required to wear masks, but have the option of wearing masks. Students are not allowed to wear masks, actually, just, I guess, with in the elementary context, they're going to be not using them properly, and it could actually be uh, the, the, the thought, anyway, is that they could be more dangerous to have students wearing masks improperly than, uh, okay. than not wearing masks at all. So we don't have the mask situation. Was there another question in there? Yes. Oh, winter um, so in winter oh, yes. time, yeah, winter time, I actually like to do a lot of things outside winter time. We go sledding. I don't know what that's going to look like, depending on whether we're allowed to use the sleds or not. Um, when we go tobogganing, we have a little hill near our school. Uh, we have snowshoes for school. I actually do an Inuit Games unit. Um, that some people on the call might have uh, been to a workshop of mine in the past somewhere. Um, so I still use the outdoors quite a bit in the winter time, um, but uh, certainly it would be more of a challenge than now. Perfect. Um, okay, and the next question is about equipment. So uh, a lot of educators in the chat, they're asking, um, th they would hope to clarify that every, uh, every student in your class, they do get a tennis ball and a sleeping rope. Right, so not just in my class, but in the school. So they were given that as in part the of their, their package at the beginning of when they came back from the shutdown. They had their package of materials and they were not mm -hmm. to take them home. They, we, the students aren't allowed to bring things back and forth from home um, and they can't share the materials with anybody. So everybody has to use their own tennis ball. They have their name on it or whatever, their own skipping rope. Yeah. Nice. And is it coming out from the department budget or? Well, that was actually uh, the skipping ropes. We've been uh, participating in Jump Rope for Heart for a while. So we actually had enough skipping ropes from our Jump yes. Rope for Heart program to make that happen. And the tennis balls mm -hmm. are absolutely free also because uh, we get them every year from our local tennis club. So um, we never buy tennis balls and get tons of them. I guess <laughs> they, they just... They have a collection of tennis balls. Tennis players like to use new tennis balls yeah. and they get their old ones. Yeah. It's true. And uh, I would recommend uh, all the educators, if you do need tennis balls, my myself is a tennis player, so I know how many tennis balls actually go on waste after one tournament. So yeah. reach out to your local clubs and uh, uh, local tennis associations. They might be able to get that, uh, uh, tennis balls for you for free. Um, okay, and the next question is still regarding equipment. So um, can you tell us more about how do you sanitize the equipment or um, if you have any recommendations um, or do you have to deal with um, 
certain issues because right now we we know that you have equipment for every single student um, but when it comes to you know centralization that like what what's your recommendation right so actually in the week we had we had an interesting situation in Quebec because we had March break early and then we had a week and then the shutdown came on so in that week when we knew that COVID was a thing uh, but we weren't shut down yet. I was actually uh, doing a, working on a basketball unit. And instead of just getting basketballs out and having one class to another, I had four balls that I used for our class. And after each class, I had a, a disinfectant, uh, a bucket of disinfectant that I washed down the balls after each class. But the kids during the class were still sharing them. Um, so that right now is not allowed. I haven't been using any equipment uh, other than what the kids have so far. I've just been given a go ahead from my administration to be able to use soccer balls or uh, uh, like frisbees if in a particular class each child has their own, so no passing the ball back and forth. Um, each child has their own and they sanitize it afterwards. So my idea right now, I'm gonna go back to my golf course, which is uh, already set. I'm gonna use the, the flying discs. I have enough for one for each kid in the class. And the final hole will be a bucket of soapy water and they wash their, uh, they wash their, fly, their disc and leave it. So the next class it's already sanitized and it's a teachable moment for them in terms of cleaning things before passing it on. Okay, nice. Um, next question is from Fiona. Um, how do you suggest the youngest students to uh, or how do you um, manage the younger youngest students to uh, manage their their space um, and uh, make sure that they follow your instruction in terms of not to interact with other students or touch each other? Like, do you do that at the beginning of the class, or what? What would you uh, your suggestions? Throughout the class, constantly for sure. My youngest students are grade three, so I only teach grade three to six. There's another phys ed teacher that teaches the K to two group. Um, and uh, But a lot of what we did when we first came back was certainly working on that distancing. So like I was saying with the, with the skipping rope, just having a visual and a physical sense of what that space is and making sure that we, we stay in our own bubble, you know, so um, so that uh, the the long jump kind of thing and just practicing it with small groups that's the thing too we really had my largest class is nine students so it's not like we're looking at a whole bunch of kids so with the smaller yeah. groups you can stay on top of it we're actually even uh we were really lucky because uh we had enough of a teacher student ratio that there are two teachers in every classroom I stay outside, one of the teachers comes out and stays with me for the period. So okay. we have two adults supervising that, either it's here or an aide. And so it was okay. it was pretty easy to keep on top of. That's okay. awesome. I'm just gonna jump in, Faye. I wanna make sure we've got some time yeah. for Glenn to chat. Yes. <laughs> Already over time. So hopefully you guys can hang on to um, listen to Glenn speak because He's got some great ideas and I know he's going to challenge yeah. all of our thinking this morning. Thank you so much, Eugene. You've left everybody with tons of great ideas and I'm super impressed with the environment you have around you within a 15 minute radius. That's amazing. That's nice. Thanks, Eugene. So I'll pass it on to Glenn. Is that uh, working? Looks good. There we go. All right. Um, again, greetings from sunny Vancouver. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your day and tuning in today. Uh, education has talked about personalized learning and being student-centered for years. COVID-19 has radically shaped the way we move, work, learn, communicate, and socialize. My session is going to focus on the silver linings the global pandemic has created, forcing education to transform. How must PHE transform to thrive in the new normal? So this is one of the problems that we see every day in our schools right now. 
students are easily disengaged because they don't know why they are learning what they are being taught. Teachers have a difficult time articulating why they're teaching what they're teaching. A motivation and boredom results. Another challenge is the world our students have, are growing up in. It's increasingly challenging to engage them as digital learners. Now we have them in a remote environment. So how are we engaging the digital learner? We look at the problem in physical education. Dr. David Kirk really summarizes this very well when he says the practice of physical education is focused primarily on the transmission of decontextualized sport techniques to large classes of children with um, who possess a range of interests and abilities. And here's the kicker, learning rarely moves beyond introductory levels. So if we look at learning and understanding, learning does not equate to understanding. Traditional curricula has focused on facts and topics. And students can Google the facts for sure. They don't need us to gain knowledge on facts, nor need to be tested on them. Facts are very specific pieces of information. They're locked in time and they don't transfer. A great example would be, let's say, in basketball, five, knowing that five players are on a court or in volleyball, six players are on a court, or the rules of a game. We, kids don't need to know that. It's not essential. Um, if we look at topics, topics organize a set of facts, but they also don't transfer. Again, a topic in basketball might be dribbling. If we look at concepts, concepts are general ideas. They're timeless and they do transfer. So in basketball, defending and attacking on person advantages, moving to open space, pressuring your opponent to make mistakes, those would be concepts. And that's what we're trying to look at in having enduring understandings versus important to know versus worth being familiar with. So when we're looking at, in, in, in the inquiry model, we're looking at trying to develop understanding, deepen understanding versus learning. So if you take a moment to reflect on how much of what you are teaching as class as an enduring understanding uh, versus important to know versus worth being familiar with. And so a lot of facts and topics fall into either worth being familiar with or important to know. But what's that? What are those really deep understandings we want the kids to take away? So where are you spending your precious time in teaching and in learning? And what are you communicating as students uh, in terms of student learning? Is it facts, is it topics, or concepts? Education systems globally have had to pivot to e-learning virtually overnight. There are many challenges to overcome and silver linings to discover. Essentially, students will have to take ownership of their learning and in turn will need to understand more about how they learn, what they like, and identify what support they will need. They'll, they'll have to personalize their learning even if the systems around them won't. So we have been in, an, in a remote environment and more than likely they're receiving some sort of weekly instruction and assignments. They're having to log in when they're required. They're having to complete assignments during the week that, and then you're trying to communicate with them as much as possible. And then uh, one of the huge challenges is really around motivation. Independently, they have to motivate themselves. And the the e-learning environment, the remote environment works well for those students who are independently motivated. But for many students who aren't, it's a real challenge. We don't have a lot of equipment to work with, and there's not a lot of safe space for them for physical activity indoors. So those are all the challenges that we're facing right now with e-learning. The technology is a huge piece. Kids know how to play with the technology but they aren't good at being productive with the technology. So how are we engaging the digital learner? Uh, generally, we're trying to disguise the fitness through creative activities, uh, using videos, trainers, celebrity trainers, i.e. Joe Wicks is an example. Um, we're going to try to gamification. We're looking at challenges. Um, again, using different types of challenges, fitness challenges, fundamental movement skill challenges physical activity challenges, a lot of do-it-yourself activities. I've seen the one with a ping pong ball going over pots and pans and trying to land in a bucket or something like that. 
So lots of those challenges, but they have a limited lifespan. As an educator, you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. What if you applied Bloom's taxonomy to these types of activities? Just take a second to look at where all these types of activities that we're engaging right now with these digital learners, where are they falling? They're, gener they're going to be in that remember, understand, and primarily in the apply. So which is fine for this first phase of what we've been doing, because it's just been about survival. But now as we move to try to, to look at learning and to, to look at un, um, teaching and learning in the fall, how can we move, shift to, to add the higher levels of blooms in what we're trying to do? So how, what can you do, what can you adapt in your practice to include all six levels? So in, engaging the digital learner, uh, if we look at an instructional strategy of inquiry-based learning, uh, backward design is one great example to do that. And then also crafting essential questions it would be another a companion piece to that. And when you have these, are already working with these types of instructional strategies, it will allow you to be nimble and quickly pivot given a face-to-face -face environment, a blended environment, or a remote environment. Crafting essential questions, for example, what should we eat would be one uh, which would go around the concept of nutrition. Can anyone be an athlete? Concept could be uh, fitness, could be fundamental movement skills. Why, do, why does how I feel affect others? The concept there would be around relationships, could be around emotions, feelings. Um, what's the toughest part about being a teenager? Again, could be around relationships, uh, health. Project-based learning is another great way to engage the digital learner and again, move up the scale in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, some things that could be done, you create a poster, have the students create a poster to avoid catching COVID or catching a cold. Uh, have the students create a video clip on how to get better at and then insert your fundamental movement skills. So they're creating a, you know, two or a two minute or one to two minute tutorial on how to get better at a, at a skill and YouTube is populated with lots of those. Uh, design a fitness program for their parents. Create a documentary on why teens don't exercise or why even adults don't exercise would be a great one. Um, and then having some, developing some sort of a student portfolio where the kids start to work on artifacts to populate that portfolio and the, and the rich conversations that you have around assessment, evaluation, learning and understanding about what goes into that student portfolio. So what new practices will you take back with you in the fall? That's the question I'd like to leave with you. And here is our contact information. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, so I don't see any questions for now, but I think we'll open the floor for the final Q&A. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, so uh, please feel free to forward them to us. Um, and uh, we will start to answer some of the questions that we were not able to answer. So uh, I guess the first question I will ask um, is from uh, Stephen. And Stephen is asking, can you please, so Eugene, can you please elaborate on the Zoom session in an empty classroom? Uh, where are the students um, Zooming from? What kind of activities did you do? Uh, Eugene, you are muted. So I will unmute you. That's okay, good. thank you. Perfect. So I was actually just in the middle of typing my answer to him, but this is better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so I was in an empty classroom. The students were in their class with one of their two uh, teachers. So they were supervised by their own teacher. Uh, and I was zooming in. I don't know if they put it on the smart board or what they did exactly, probably that. Um, and I had a, a, a little video on good posture, I had another video on uh, how the heart works for a different class. Um, then we did a chair workout. 
I have different pencil flip challenges at their desk. So that they would put their skipping rope that they have on their desk in a circle and flip the pencil. And one point if it lands on the edge, on the front edge, two points if it lands on the back edge, and three points if it lands in the middle of the circle without touching the edge. Uh, a shoe flip challenge as well. So just little things that they can do at their desk uh, without any other materials than what they already have. Um, there was something else that I haven't gotten to yet uh, that was, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called. Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a puzzle kind of thing that they can make just with a piece of paper and cutting, cutting out squares and stacking them on top of each other. So different kinds of, that's not necessarily physical activity, but it's a, it's a kind of a, of a brain concentration activity and fine order skills and so on too. Perfect. Um, next question is from Christina, and the question is for Glenn. So, um, and the question is, please expand on the student portfolio that you mentioned. The portfolio is a way for students to start to understand um, what we want as student learning, how we want to communicate student learning. So, if we start looking at you know, our uh, out learning outcomes or standards, whatever we have, uh, what is the artifact and the evidence that's going to show that the student has met that? And so how are students representing learning? How are students making learning visible? That's, that's what we would be looking at in the, um, with the portfolio. So it, you, could, you could have, uh, you know, the student look at, for example, if you're looking at, uh, acquiring a fundamental movement skill, a competence in fundamental movement skills, the students could create a video that shows that they've attained some sort of competency. Uh, and then again, as they start to uh, submit initial versions of it, you can talk to them about, well, okay, what what exactly, if it's, you know, if it's hopping or skipping or throwing, um, what you can start to break down and give them feedback in, in terms of what that's supposed to look like and the student can go back and work on it. Great answer. And the next question is from Lenny. Uh, it's also a question for Glenn. So any strategies for PD to introduce the conceptual teaching over facts and definitions? Sorry, say that again, Faye. I quite didn't understand the question. So, um, any strategy for PD, I guess, um, professional development to introduce the conceptual teaching over facts and definitions? Yeah, that's um, the, the the professional development is that uh, is the is the question around uh, individual looking for it or is it for uh like giving it to a staff i'm, I'm can you maybe just clarify yeah. that so lenny if you can clarify that question uh we'll come back to that um so the next question uh, we'll go to matt's question so the question is uh glenn can you share insights on how to foster learning uh, not just activity but learning with uh young listeners I think it's 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 what everybody on the call already <laughs> has. They you it's it's the teacher. You you are the person that creates the that love of learning. You are the person that is in front of those kids and makes it exciting for them. Um, it, it it's not it. There's no secret sauce to it. The teacher is the person who makes the magic happen. And so, you know, being open to uh, different instructional strategies, uh, open to different types of activities. Eugene pointed out in his, uh, you know, what I got from Eugene's was that how sort of a, a narrow mindset we've had with traditional mm -hmm. phys ed in the gym of activities that we do. And, and again, COVID is now making us explore all these other aspects of, of our physical education curriculum that we've had available to us, but we've really ignored like moving outdoors, looking at individual pursuits, leisure activities, that's more of an emphasis now. And, and we've ignored a lot of that and just focused on games. 
Good answer. So we'll maybe have for two more questions and uh, we'll call it, call it a day. So next question is for Eugene. Um, and I, I think it's a good question. So you mentioned that you have nine students in your classroom. So um, is that the maximum number that you have? And do you rotate students? So right now in this situation, I've got nine students. There's another mm -hmm. online um, uh, part for the students that are that have stayed at home because it's been a voluntary return to school in the Quebec context. Um, uh -huh. So the provincial limit is 15, but our classrooms can really only handle a maximum of 10 with the two meters distancing. And nine is the most that have that we have in our groups right now at uh, from three, three to six. Okay. Great. And so next question is from Rochelle. Um, and the question is, uh, she said, I've taught for 17 years in HPE and uh, she has never heard for uh, heard about blooms. Can you please explain what is blooms briefly? Thank you. Bloom's taxonomy is um, sort of a, a way to look at um, the con concepts of what you're trying to teach. Uh, traditionally, you know, back in the in the 60s and maybe even in the 70s, everything was on um, rote uh, memory and recall, and that's where a lot of testing was. And so it's it's around thinking and higher and learning. And so higher order thinking skills are in bloom when you when you do activities that you're looking at analyzing uh, versus just recall. So um, really, really blooms okay. is just a way to look at um, content and how you're trying to get information across to. Uh, students, uh, assignments, how, how your instructional practice is really designed. Um, you know, remembering something versus creating something or evaluating something or analyzing something. And lots of um, curricula use these verbs, Bloom's taxonomy, use the verbs as sort of the what they're looking for for teachers to try to do with the kids in terms of the learning outcomes or standards. Um, that's great. And um, sorry, uh, Lenny did get back to me. Um, so the question was, um, sorry, I'm gonna go, go to that question. So strategies for professional development to introduce the conceptual teaching over facts and definitions. So um, Lenny said that that PD would be forced and supervisors. Uh, so a large, large group of people. Yeah, so, you know, really it, it's finding, um, it's finding someone in the district to mm -hmm. whoever is uh, responsible for PD in the district to get their ear and say, hey, you know, this is something that we are interested in looking at and then finding, you know, different presenters that are able to deliver that. Uh, there's also lots of, um, now, again, digitally, there's lots of stuff available, but I, I'm still old fashioned and I think face to face is, is still the best way to try to deliver PD if possible. Yeah. Lenny can um, contact me directly as well. Um, if I haven't yeah. answered the question, I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Thank you for offering that. Um, I would like to add another question. I guess I'll just uh, throw this question to all the panelists here because I think it's a really good question. So, um, this question is from, uh, let's see, Just give me a sec here, uh, from Laura. Uh, and the question is about recess. So, we all know it is important to uh, allow uh, and empower the kids from, uh, you know, the, the process of play. Um, and then with the current situation, um, how do you think uh, school admins or teachers to like, what they do to encourage play during recess and how they can manage the physical distancing during, during recess? So maybe we'll start with Eugene. 
Yeah, I've got to go teach in uh, <laughs> I'll say goodbye after this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got different uh, resource, uh, recess times set up. So they're staggered recesses so that not everybody is out at the same time. And each class has their own recess zone. Um, so again, when they're out at recess, they're not mixing with uh, the other classes. They've got their own space. Um, and so far that's worked pretty well. And again, they've got a, their own teacher, one of their own teachers supervising there. We've been really lucky having those two adults in the class at all times so they can spell each other off for their, uh, for their planning periods pretty much any time they want during the day. And so that works out. So I'm gonna say goodbye. Thank you, Eugene. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That was great. And if anybody uh, Sherry wants to and in touch with me, you can feel feel free to send my email out to them. Okay, so I will share Eugene's email in the chat later. Um, and thank you again. Um, it's been great. Thanks, Eugene. Thank Bye -bye. You. And Sherry, Glenn, uh, do you want to add anything regarding the recess uh, practice? I think the guidelines are clear with two meters apart, not sharing equipment. Mm -hmm. So the language we use with children to make it a positive experience is very important. We're going to do the best we can and to keep continually reminding them. In some of our schools, kids are allowed to bring some of their own equipment and areas of the playground are organized for specific groups and having recess at different times. So some of our schools are half full, some are 75%, some 30%. So it's really figuring it out on your site, but also making it positive and a learning that is continuous where students are involved in setting those guidelines, I think is really important moving forward. Yeah, just to reiterate that uh, recess really mm -hmm. has to be supervised. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you need an adult out there reinforcing the, the two meters because the kids will naturally get mm -hmm. to try to get together. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, I think that's a wrap. Uh, Shannon, uh, Sherry, Glenn, is there anything else that you want to add? I just wanted to say thank you to Sherry Glenn and Eugene for agreeing to be part of this panel. There's been some great discussions, some fantastic ideas, and thank you to everybody who joined the call for all of your questions and engagement, and of course to PHE Canada for making sure that this kind of thing happens. So thank you.